So, for anyone that was here last week, um, what did we go through? What did we go through? What did we cover in two hours and 20 minutes last week? Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Okay, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? That was one of the questions. Yeah, that was one thing that we covered. In fact, if there's someone, if there's someone here that didn't get to speak last week and you wanted to speak, you, got, you have an opportunity uh, this week. So one of the questions was, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Um, why did we ask that question? Does anyone remember? We talked about how if we are brought before the officials, mm -hmm. what answer we should give as mm -hmm. a defence mm -hmm. to anything that to us. Right. And um, I think that's where we started and then yeah. unpacked it from there. Right, okay. So that was first Peter 315. Uh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, Peter yeah. said that we should sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to any man that asks us off. a reason of hope within us. Yeah, we meet us and we fear. Okay. Yeah, First Peter three fifteen. Where else? Where did we go after that? Um, I mean, I tuned in for the last part, and from what I remember, was using uh, was it Daniel? Uh, keep talking as now. an example. Keep going. Keep going, Samantha. I can't quite remember. <laughs> Okay, for, for, maybe I, I might be wrong here, but um, from what I remember was how Daniel stood his ground. Daniel was a faithful and truthful man throughout mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and using him as an example because he lived in Babylonian times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Am I way off? Or? No, 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 no. I remember. I remember. I just couldn't remember what. Yeah. Context. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's what I remember, and him being a very good example for the times we're living in. Okay. So excellent. that's what I remember. We went through. Excellent. Last week. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Anyone else? So that, that Andre. Yes, Sister Douglas. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, can hear you. The questions. Pardon? Where we came from? Why am I here? Okay. What should I do now? And where am I going? Right. Right. Yeah, we covered that right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, excellent. And, um, and we have um, the long lost family mm -hmm. LC program right out. I've got mm -hmm. right out the text. Um, you said also we have nothing to fear. Mm -hmm. Nothing and to fear for the Genesis future. Says, mm -hmm. You talked about Abraham coming. Right. Uh, okay. And and, and he said, Abraham came out, mm -hmm. and what he and he said unto him, mm -hmm. he said, and um, they to be his people. Mm -hmm. He gave them back the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. He was really renewing, recapping. That's mm -hmm. right, that word, recapping. And the sanctuary, the diet, the gift of prophecy, dress mm -hmm. reform, mm -hmm. and uh, corn from heaven. Mm -hmm. And heaven help laws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you did all the effort that's Deuteronomy, Hosea, Chronicles, Old Testament. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Let me move this on. So somebody else help out Sister Douglas. So we started here in Genesis 15, Genesis 13, Genesis 15. Abram called out. Why, why was he called out? For what so purpose? God has a special word for him to do his mm -hmm. name. Yep, to preserve his name. And uh, he had a special work for Abram, Abram to do. What else? And, and he was going to begin to make a nation after him. Okay. Okay. So then after Abram, who, else, who did God call out next? And where did he call them out from? Was it Israel called out from Egypt? Yep, Israel called out from. Oh, one second. Somebody's at my door. Hold on a second. Israel from Egypt and 
when God called out Israel from Egypt, what did he give them? Why, in fact, why did he call them out? He, the renewing the, the, the Ten Commandments, the things they had lost. Mm -hmm. The Ten Commandments, he went over the things that, that um, they had forgotten and mm -hmm. lost in, when they were in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, we traveled from uh, Old Testament. And where did we go next? We went to Acts. Okay. And why, Church and mission. Yeah. Why did, why did we go to Acts? What was happening? Does anyone... Seven churches of Revelation. Uh, we, you're too far. Too far. <laughs> oh, yeah. not, not quite there yet. Anyone else want to help out Sister Douglas? Acts. Yeah, we, 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 we went to the New I Testament. I just made a note. It says, Acts, um, raise up 12. Mm -hmm. Preach, teach, healing. Acts okay. 11. Was this New Testament? Say that again, sorry. For the New Testament Christians to preserve their truth and bring forward in light. Yeah, absolutely. He called out New Testament Christians. What had happened to the larger body of Israel? What had happened to them? We we we, we read it. We read it um, describing the scribes and the Pharisees and some of of of, of Israel. Mm -hmm. They had put human, what? They had put human tradition in place of. Or oh, God's, God's commandment. Yeah, in, God, in place of God's commandment, okay? So, they, so God called out New Testament Christians, uh, Acts, as you say, Sister Douglas. Then where did we go? We did something in Revelation to yeah, the Testament. Yeah, the yeah. We went to Ephesus. You remember? Ephesus. Church, yeah. And then we went to Smyrna. And then we went to Pergamos. Pergamos, yes, yeah. Pergamos. And what was what 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 was interesting, uh, if you can remember, what was one thing that God commended Ephesus for, that they hated the doctrine of who? The, 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 the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans, yeah, who were antinomians, which would mean they were without law. But by the time you get to Pergamos, three twenty three A.D. What was happening to the church? There was a lot of compromise. Absolutely, there was a lot of compromise. So from a from a, a pure church in Ephesus, you start having compromise. In fact, Smyrna was the persecuted church. So the persecuted church, in order to be a Christian, you had to knew, know what you believed because you were going to be persecuted if you named yourself Christian. And in Pergamos, uh, as you said, Sister Douglas, is, a, is the compromising church. And then we moved to the fourth church, which was what? Um, fourth church of, of the seven churches. Um, Begins with T. Uh, yes, Thyatira. Yeah, Thyatira, Thyatira. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Um, and what was significant about Thyatira? Hmm. The Dark Ages. Uh, uh, what about the Dark Ages? What, what is, what, give me a little bit more information, please. Um, well, 60 years of papal supremacy. Okay. Darkness. No okay. Bible allowed. Okay. What else? And then that was 1938 to 1798. Okay. And then I heard... we come to Genesis 29. But God began to bring his truths back. Okay. Sister Douglas took and some we, extensive notes last week. <laughs> and then okay. we got to Ezekiel 4, 6. Okay. Yeah. So, so we don't, yeah, we don't need those in, um, details for this week. Um, what happened between 538 to 1798? What did, what did God begin to do? It began to bring back his truths to them. Okay. Them verse, um, Genesis 29. Uh-huh. 26 to 27. Okay, someone other than Sister Douglas, let me, let me say like I'm in a classroom. Someone other than Sister Douglas, through what avenue or through what medium or through what uh, vehicle did God begin to bring his truths back? Protestant Reformation. The, the what, sorry? 
Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation. Okay, good. Um, and is then right? it, it is right. It is right. <laughs> it is right. Um, and then after, well, not not du during the Protestant Reformation. No, not during. What happened at the end of the Protest not the Protestant Re Reformation? What happened at the end of the twelve sixty years? Hmm. What happened? Revelation chapter thirteen, verse ten. What happened? Um, deadly wound. Deadly wound of who? Berthier. Uh, not Berthier. He was involved, but it wasn't the deadly wound of Berthier. Deadly wound of who? Pope. Uh, not just the Pope. <laughs> he was involved. Papacy. Of the papacy. Okay, okay. Deadly wound of the papacy. And what did that mean? What does that mean? I think that, that time the... Um was receiving back the religious and civil. They were receiving um, back or they were stripped of? In fact, they were stripped. Oh. They were stripped of um, the religious and civil powers. Uh, of the civil powers. They were still, they were still a, a, a church, but they were stripped of the, of the civil powers. So what did that mean? What couldn't they do now? What couldn't the papacy do now that they could have done during the 1260? They couldn't kill. kill people. They couldn't kill, yeah. They couldn't kill because they didn't have the power of the state. Okay. Um, so then we also saw that um, prophecy moved from the old world to where? New world. The new world. So from Europe to the Americas. <laughs> okay. Good, 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 good. We got there. We got there. So this next screen... Um, just is 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 a a timeline you want to say, or um, yes, yeah, a timeline of some of the the truths that were brought back or restored back during the Reform the the, the um, Protestant Reformation. So, if you've ever, if you've got the Great Controversy, I I advise you strongly encourage you uh, to take it out and start reading it again, um, especially. Um, uh, well, from the beginning, <laughs> from the beginning, uh, which is the destruction of Jerusalem and then an era of spiritual darkness. And then we start moving through what we're about to go, what we've been going through for the last couple of weeks. So the Waldenses, um, and I'll just, I'll just quickly put those back up. Um, so you can see as we were, as we were traveling from Genesis to Revelation and out the other end uh, in regards to scripture, we also were moving forward in, in time. Can you see that? You can see that. Okay, good. So now we're kind of up to speed. Um, and for those that weren't here last week, um, the, the recording is on YouTube. Um, if you don't have the, the, the link, um, either ask somebody who you do know that has the link or I'll send me a message and I'll send it uh, to you. So we had the Waldenses, we had uh, Jan Hus, Obedience, we had Martin Luther. Now, the reason I put um, Martin Luther there as um, 1517, uh, October 31, what happened on that date? What happened 50, What happened October 31, 1517? Oh, Luther, Luther nailed his protest to the door of the church. Yeah, he... he, he how, many, how many tenants were there? How many points to his protest? 95. Okay, 95. Ex excellent. 95 um, points of protest. And it was significant that he posted it October 31 because he knew that people would be out and then people would gather and they would see it. And then we move through to, to um, Christian growth, Calvin, um, Anabaptist, baptism by immersion and um, holiness, John Wesley, 18th century. So now, now we're up to uh, the 18th century. And then God starts to do a, 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 another thing or continuation of the Protestant Reformation. Now here, here's why I put 1517 there. In 2017 was the 500th year of the Protestant Reformation. And what the papacy did with the Lutherans was that they declared the Protestant Reformation over. Do you remember that? I, I don't know how, how many people remember that. that yeah. whole, it was a whole year. 
they yeah. declared the Protestant Reformation over. They said that they had a joint uh, treaty that they'd signed, and that there were no more. There were no more protesting, or, or, or the Lutherans were no more protesting against Catholicism because um, the, the, the 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 misunderstanding has been uh, rectified. How many of you believe that? Is the Reformation over? No. No. Okay. So how how who does no, it continue with? Who does it oh. continue? With? Who's us? The remnant. <laughs> Come on, you're giving me, you're too generic. As <laughs> in the 21st century, the times we're living in. Right, so, so, so there's a group, as you're gonna see, there's a group of people that God has raised to continue the protest. And the protest is going to continue all the way until the end of time, all the way until the final test. And you are part of the denomination, you're part of the movement, not even the denomination, you're part of the movement that has been called to maintain the protest. Now look at the rich heritage that you've got, Bible, obedience, grace, growth, baptism by immersion, holiness. And what we're gonna go through this afternoon is what other thing, what other truths did God bring back um, with this, uh, this group of people uh, who later become Seventh-day Adventists, but they don't start off like that. So who's this man? William Miller. Beverly. William Miller. Who did you say, Sister Douglas? William Miller. Yes. Are you on opposite side now? Yeah, <laughs> William Miller. And um, why, 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 why do you think we we we're, we're beginning with him? Because he's the first one. Um, remember last week, Brethren. I said this is a Bible study. It's not a presentation. It's not a sermon. We're here to interact. We're here. It doesn't matter if you get it wrong here, as long as you don't get it wrong when we're actually tested on it. Um, so the best place to learn is at school, <laughs> okay? So uh, shout out the answers. If you're incorrect, we, we can correct that. Um, but we need to make sure that we're understanding what we believe and understanding uh, our heritage. So who is this? William Miller. William Miller, excellent. And why is he, why is he important to this study? 1844. Carl, she said 1844, but that, that doesn't, if I was a prosecutor, I'd say to you, it was a Baptist that, preacher. It was an active preacher about what? The return of Jesus. The, re, the, the return of Jesus. Okay. Yeah. The second coming. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let me leave you alone a little bit. So William Miller born 15th of February, 1782. When he's 31, he becomes a Navy captain. He goes away, becomes a Navy captain. And then two years later, when he's 33, he, he comes back and he moves his, his, his family uh, to upstate New York. And he, there he begins to study the Bible. Now, he has always been a religious man, but because of influence, he kind of um, relinquished his faith. But when he came back, he was just unsettled that he'd... he'd reneged as it were on his faith and he came back and he began to study the scriptures fervently and he believed that the scriptures were their own expositor was its own expositor it, it, meaning he believed that the bible answered itself so he would study the bible and when he came up against a text that he didn't understand rather than read past it he would go to his crudence concordance and he would cross-reference the text till he, he, he came to an understanding. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that sound like good Bible study method? Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So he, 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 would, he would study the scriptures with his crudence concordance. He would find cross references to the particular text, get an understanding, and then he would move on. And then uh, when he came to Daniel 8, 14, he became overwhelmed with, a, with the sense of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus's imminent return. Now, after much study in 1818, he was convinced that Jesus would return in about 25 years. Yeah, in about 25 years, Jesus would return. Um, but he did. He he shared his he shared his um, his findings with a few friends, but he had <coughs> really. Um, he never really shared it in public. No, he, not never really. He just never shared it in public. Um, he was frightened that people would think that he was a crazy man and 
Um, he just didn't want that. So he never shared it in the public, but he kept getting the urge to go and tell the world. Now, remember, he's, he's at Daniel 8.14. Now, let me ask you a question. What does Daniel 8.14 say? <laughs> yeah, really. what, what does Daniel 8.14 say? It's the to 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Excellent, excellent. Unto, and he, he, yeah, and, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So he came up upon this text, and for years he was studying it, and he became convinced that Christ was going to be coming back in, in about 25 years. Now, he didn't set a date, but he set a period, okay? And he, he, like I said, he didn't, he didn't share, he didn't preach in public, he was sharing with his friends, but he kept getting the urge, uh, go and tell the world. And then he writes, what we're going to do this afternoon is we're going to hear from the pioneers themselves or the, the, the Millerites themselves, how they felt about a situation. I'm not going to tell you how they felt. They're going to they're gonna speak to you themselves through their writings. So one day he, he's, he's, he's in his, his office, his study, and he's wrestling, 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 wrestling with this text. And then he writes this, the impression was so sudden and came with such force that I settled down into my chair saying, I can't go. So you, William Mill is talking about, he's studying the text, studying the scriptures, and he's feeling this impression go into the world. And he settles down in, chest, in his chair and says, you know what, I can't go. Why not seem to be the response? And then all my excuses came up, uh, my want of ability, but my distress became so great. So a little bit like Moses, a little bit like us, God tells us to do something, tells us, tells us that he wants us to do something. And... All of the excuses that we have come up in, in, in our mind. Uh, I don't know enough. I don't have enough funds. Uh, I'm, what am I going to do to survive? Same thing happened to William Miller. All the, all the excuses came up into his mind. And then he says, I entered into a solemn... What's that next word? I entered into a solemn... Covenant. 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 At the moment, in, in the lesson study, we're studying about covenants, right? Mm -hmm. yeah and, and what is a covenant an agreement it's an agreement that's only broken by what <coughs> mm -hmm. disobedience well not necessarily disobedience but by death a, a, a true covenant is only broken by death okay. so when, when you when you when you make a covenant at the at the altar you say for in sickness and in health for richer for poorer till death. death do we do we part or do you part same thing with a baptism. It's a covenant. You promise yeah. to walk the same way with God all the way. And the only way that it's broken or, and dis or annulled is through death. So he says, I entered into a solemn covenant with God that if he would open the way, I would go and perform my duty to the world. Now, he, he continues to write late, uh, uh, outside of these, this, this quote. He himself didn't think, at this point, he's about 50 years old. He didn't think that anybody was going to ask a 50-year-old to preach about the second coming of Christ. Remember, he's been studying this for 13 years. So he's, 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 he, he says that he's having this conversation with God, and he enters into a solemn covenant with God, that if he would open the way, I would go and perform my duty to the world. What do you mean by opening the way seem to come to me? This is him writing. Why, said I, if I should have an invitation to speak publicly in any place, I will go and tell them what I find in the Bible about the Lord's coming. So do you hear what covenant he's made? Yeah. The covenant is, if you open the way, I'll go and I'll speak publicly. Remember, up to this point, he hasn't spoken publicly. I will speak publicly in any place and tell them what I find in the Bible about the coming of the Lord. Now watch what happens. This is amazing. Amazing. In about half an hour from this time, before I had left the room, a son of Mr. Guilford of Dresden, about 16 miles from my residence, came in and said that his father had sent for me and wished me to go with him. Supposing that he wished me to, wished to see me on some business, I asked him what he wanted. He replied that there was to be no preaching in their church the next day. And his father wished to have me come and talk to the people on the subject of what? The Lord's coming. The Lord's coming. Listen to, watch, what, watch his response. 
I was immediately angry with myself for having made the covenant I had. I rebelled at once against the Lord and determined not to go. Why, why is Miller so angry? I don't know if you know the history of, of, of this particular situation, but why, why is Miller so angry? Because, well, yeah. because it's difficult. It, there's a lot of difficulty with it. Okay, there's a lot of difficulty. Why else? Breaking he was afraid. Yeah. He was afraid. I, I heard someone else speaking. Breaking the covenant meant death. Okay. He, 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 yeah. He, 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 was angry. he was angry that he'd made the covenant. Um, and remember, exactly. He didn't expect to be called. Now watch this. Watch this. How far away did the young man come? 16 miles. 16 miles. Now, in those days... How did you travel? Horse and cart. Horse and cart, Horse and cart or you walked. So <laughs> this man or this young man arrives half an hour after William Miller has made this covenant, <clears throat> which means that he started long before William Miller made the covenant because he's traveling 16 miles. Now I did some maths and I, I asked, I, I went to Google and I said, how long does it take to travel on horseback 16 miles in those days with rough terrain? You know how long it took? Roughly. Four hours. Four hours. Yeah, four, four hours, four and a half hours. So for, the, for this young man to arrive at William Millen's house 30 minutes after he had made this covenant with God, that means that he had been sent before William Miller had made the covenant, mm -hmm. before he had made the, his, his, uh, his agreement with God. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. That is because God knows everything. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he knew that he would have um, entered into this covenant with him. And um, he didn't expect, William Miller didn't expect that it would be so quick. Uh, absolutely. Would... <laughs> absolutely. So in the previous day, he's, he's, he's wrestling with God and says, look, you give me an opportunity to speak, I'll go and preach. Half an hour later, someone comes and said, look, we need you to preach. And look how specific the message is. I need you to come to the church and speak on the subject of the Lord's coming. And this person had traveled 16 miles. So God, William Miller knew that God's hand was in his calling. And he says that he stormed out of his office and he went into, the, into his grove. And he was pacing up and down, pacing up and down. And his daughter saw him pacing up and down and went to speak to his mother and said, Mom, something's wrong with daddy. Something was wrong with him because he realized that he couldn't reason his way out of the covenant that he'd made. And then that famous line says that he went into the grove, a farmer, but came out a preacher. He went into the grove, a farmer, but came out a preacher. So now the word, now it's, now it's on. The message of the soon coming uh, or the imminent coming of Jesus Christ is about to go public. So who is this man? Does anyone know? Uh. Joseph Mage. No, no, no. He, he, his name does begin with um, V J, but it's not. It's no. His name is Joshua V Himes. Joshua Vaughan Himes. Now, Joshua Himes was a Christian leader uh, and a publisher and a promoter at, at the time of William Miller. He was born in 1805, made in 19th. He was born to wealthy, wealthy parents, and he was destined to be an Episcopalian minister. Um. As you can see though, it says financial tragedy hit the family and the young Himes became a cabinet maker. The history is that his father had sent a boat with cargo to the, to the Caribbean. And somewhere between leaving the state and the Caribbean, the cargo was lost in terms of, no, the, 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 it just disappeared. No one knows if the man ran off with the cargo or it sunk. Um, but financial tragedy hit the family and he became a cabinet maker. And he later becomes involved after hearing the message of William Miller. He later becomes involved with William Miller and says, look, people need to hear this message. And as a promoter, he said, I will get many open doors for you to preach this message. So now you have William Miller um, preaching the second coming of Christ in a few years. And you have Joshua V. Himes, who's promoting William Miller and giving him 
a an open door for him to for him to preach. So 1840, uh, William Miller, Joshua V. Himes. Uh, Miller and Himes stood, as it were, at the forefront of the battle. Now, remember what God is doing. God is bringing out a, a denominated people, number one, and he's bringing out truths that have been lost during the, during the, the, the Dark Ages and, and, and prior. So Miller and Himes stand, as it were, at the forefront of the battle in the second advent movement in America and were only two among scores who labored with them in proclaiming the doctrine of the advent of Christ. Now, as William Miller began to preach, the message started to snowball. It was a message that people hadn't heard before and the way that he preached it and the potency that he preached it and the way that he used his scriptures to preach it, many people joined um, the, the, the message. Many, many people joined um, the movement. Uh, what was the movement called? Does anyone know what 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 was the movement called? It was named after him. Miller right movement. Miller right movement. Miller right, yeah, the Miller right movement. Good. good, 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 good. So the preaching of Christ's second coming in the 1844 was not limited to just the USA. The message was heard in places such as England, Europe, Asia. So you can see. Um, from, from the screen there. So this message started to snowball. So what started off as one man reading his scriptures, studying his scriptures, getting to a point and becoming enamored with the, the, the truth that he found there, sharing it amongst his friends. Now it's gone public and the whole world is beginning to hear this message. Daniel 8, 3 through 27 and Daniel 9, 20 through 27, constitute the emphasis of this preaching. So now, let me ask you a question now. What does Daniel 8, 3 through 27 talk about? And what does Daniel 9, 20 through 27 talk about? What does Daniel 8, 3 through 27 talk about? And what does Daniel 9, 20 through 27 talk about? <laughs> Jesus Christ, yeah. The what, sorry? Jesus Christ. There's, there's noise in the background. I, I, all I'm hearing is Jesus Christ. The what of Jesus Christ? The coming, the coming, the advent, the coming of Jesus Christ. Um, in a roundabout kind of way, but more specifically, what does, the, okay, let, let's take it one point by point. What does Daniel <laughs> end uh, Okay, so uh, again, still very um, generic. Let's be specific. Let's, let's, let's pretend that you are uh, under court, you're in, the, you're in the dock, and they're asking you, um, what does Daniel 8, 3 through 27 speak about? You can use your Bibles if you want. The sanctuary. Okay, but what about the sanctuary? And which, which, which chapters are you talking about? So... Hey. Daniel 8 yep. is talking about the 2300 day prophecy and Daniel 9 is about the 70 week prophecy. Okay, okay. So Daniel 8, 3 through 27 talks about the ram, the goat, the four horns that come up on the head of the goat, the little horn that comes up afterward, the desolation of the sanctuary and the 2300 days. That's Daniel 8, okay? Daniel 9, 20 through 27 um, the first part of the chapter talks about Daniel. In fact, it says that he was reading and studying the prophet Jeremiah and realizes that his, his, the, the Jews' emancipation was imminent. Um, and then uh, 20 through 27 talks about the 70-week prophecy. There are six things that were going to happen um, or that were prof prophesied um, to, to take place for, for which people? Let me ask you that. For which people specifically? For the Jews, sir. For the Jews and for which, and for what place? So for the Jews Jerusalem. and for Jerusalem. Excellent, excellent. Brothers and sisters, make sure you're taking notes. Make sure you're taking notes. Please, 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 please. So Daniel chapter 8, the 2300 days, talking about the, um, uh, including the ram and the goat, the four horns, the little horn, the desecration of the sanctuary. Daniel chapter 9, the 70 weeks. Um, 70 weeks are de determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city too. And then the angel lists uh, six things, I think it is. 
um, that were going to take place in uh, those 70, that 70 week period. What was Millerite Adventism? Now, remember last week I said, we are not just Adventists. Why did I say that? Does anyone remember? We are not just Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists. We're Seventh-day Adventists, which means what? You believe in the seventh day also, not just all Christians believe, well, many Christians believe in the coming of Christ. Right. <laughs> believe that seventh day is a Sabbath. Right, okay. Primarily, yes, absolutely. Um, and as we, as we see, what God did is on top of that, he began to bring some peculiar truths that only the Seventh-day Adventist people were going to preach because it's, it's his last day team, as it were, for the Reformation. Uh, Andre, Max. Can you repeat again? Repeat. Okay, which part? Why we're not just Adventists? Yeah, what, what does it mean to be an Adventist? So, so, so basically, just to, to be an Adventist just means you are looking for the second Advent of Jesus Christ. Says the nothing about... Pardon? What coming or the Advent, yeah? The Advent, the second coming. Yeah, the Advent of, mm -hmm. of, or the second coming. But that doesn't say anything about anything. <laughs> there are, there are um, first aid Christians who are looking for the Advent. There are uh, Sabbath-keeping Christians who aren't Seventh-day Adventists who are also looking for the, the, um, the second coming. But there's something different about Seventh-day Adventism. Seventh-day Adventists, and we unfortunately we don't have the. Why is there so much noise in the background? <laughs> I, I'm not entirely sure. I, I'm I'm not going to mandate everyone take their turn their mic off because it's an interactive study. But please do be mindful if you have got background noise. So what is Millerite Adventism? <clears throat> so the Adventists or the Millerites, as they were known in the USA, became because of William Miller, were a loosely, loosely connected group. Miller was a Baptist but his adherents represented many other churches. So I'm gonna read the statement and then I'm going to ask you a question and it's going to test your knowledge uh, on the sanctuary. So be prepared for it. Initially, Miller believed that the cleansing of the sanctuary spoken of in Daniel 8, 14 represented the removal of sin from the church. However, as he continued to study he came to the conclusion that the text referred to the cleansing of sin from the church and for the purification of the world by fire. Question. Mm, how do I ask this? Why did William Miller think after reading 1844 that it was going to be the world that was cleansed by fire? Why did he think that? Did he think that the sanctuary was on earth? Yeah, part of the, yeah, he did think part of the sanctuary was on earth. Why was that? Because uh, most churches back then were teaching that. Okay, because most churches back then were teaching that. Why else? From, from your understanding of the sanctuary, why do you think William Miller thought that the cleansing of the sanctuary was going to include the purification of the world by fire? With your knowledge of the sanctuary, let me let me narrow it in a little bit. He thought it is the final uh, day of atonement. But why the earth? Why not just the sanctuary in heaven? Okay, let me ask you this question. Because no, go on, go because, on. Um, I think you're alluding to the fact that sin was con was consumed on the altar of sacrifice by fire okay. okay so we're getting somewhere so so where did so sin was consumed on the altar of sacrifice who who did the ram the lamb represent jesus jesus christ how do you know what to, give me give me give me give me give me one scripture that tells me that jesus is the lamb of the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world. When, when, John, when John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which what, taketh away the sin of the world. What scripture is that, Carl? Uh, give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> There's another one in Matthew chapter 1. Connected with what Carl is talking about. Uh, 
Okay, so in Matthew chapter one, while we're waiting for for Carl, um, Matthew chapter one, uh, Andre, yes, Andre, John one, John one twenty nine, absolutely, John one twenty nine, coupled with Matthew chapter one and verse twenty one. Yeah, we see that Christ was the Lamb of God that was going to take away the sin of the world. Good. Where did the Lamb die? In re- in reference to the sanctuary. Outer court. In the outer court. In the outer court, on what piece of furniture? Is it the altar of sacrifice? Outer altar of sacrifice. Good. So Christ died on the altar of sacrifice on the earth, and the earth then represented the outer court, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So. If the, you, the Day of Atonement, where does the Day of Atonement begin? Where does it end, should I say? When the goat, the, 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 the gate gold is taken. Okay, I'm hearing many voices. Where, the question is not when does it end, where does it end? Most holy. No, oh, most not, holy no it, doesn't, it doesn't end in the most holy. But when a goat is taken out to the... To, to the field and and, 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 and and taken to the wilderness. No, it doesn't end there either. Be, um, the, the day of, by the time the goat is taken out uh, by the, the hand of the fit man, the day of atonement is already finished. The scapegoat has no part to play <coughs> in the day of atonement, but it doesn't finish in the, the, the most holy place either. Where does it finish? Where does the day of atonement finish? It's back on, on in the outer court. In the outer court. What text can you give me? Because the high priest made the atonement mm-hmm. from the most holy place first coming out. Right. And what text says that? Leviticus. Leviticus chapter. You can provide. <laughs> <laughs> Leviticus chapter 16. Let's go there. Leviticus chapter 16. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 16. And we're going to read from verse 29 all the way through to 34. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29, all the way through to 34. And this statute, and this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, shall ye afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or of the stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. And the priest whom he shall appoint, anoint, and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead, shall make the anointment, an atonement, sorry, and shall put on his linen clothes, even the holy garments. Now watch the direction of the cleansing. And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of congregation, and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priests, and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statue unto you, to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Which way was the cleansing of the sanctuary? It was from the inside out, correct? Yes. It was from the inside out. Remember, for for 359 days of the year, the sins went into the sanctuary. Every day, morning and evening, the morning oblation, the evening oblation. The, The sins went into the sanctuary. The priest would take them in. But on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, he would begin in the most holy place and work his way out. Because now he's cleansing the record of sin out of the of of the sanctuary does that make sense yes so mill so miller now understanding that think says to himself okay if the sanctuary is going to be cleansed and christ died in the outer court which was the earth then the ending of the day of atonement must be on the earth it was logical but there was a step that he was missing there was something that he didn't fully understand that they didn't fully understand but can you understand why they got to at least that point Mm. Okay, okay. Yes. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. So, as Willem Miller began to preach and teach, and people began to um, join the message, and the throngs um, got bigger and bigger, bigger, hope and happiness soon turned to depression, despair, and despondency. Why, why was that? Why did that happen? 
Because I thought Jesus was coming. Because Jesus was not coming. Because Jesus, uh, Jesus didn't come now, okay? But I, I think it's because they, they, um, they, they knew it was something serious at this time, but you know they didn't know how to 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 sort it. Okay, so what to do. So, so, so what you're talking about, Sister Douglas, is not true of the whole group. It's true of some of them, definitely. But at the moment, uh, it's not true of the whole group. So what started off as about 50,000 adherents to Millerite Adventism, because, the, because of their loosely connectedness, soon whittled down the day after and, 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 and subsequent days to just about 50 or 100 people. So from 50,000, to, 50, uh, to, uh, to between 50 and 100 faithful people. Now, let me, let, me, let, me, let me make this point, and then I'm gonna ask you another question. They actually experienced two disappointments. Did you know that? They experienced a disappointment in the spring, and they, dis they, 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 they experienced a disappointment in the autumn. Because when they went back to the scriptures, they realized that the decree given by Artaxerxes was in the autumn, wasn't in the spring. But when we, when we deal with um, the 70 weeks in a few weeks time, we'll look more on that point. So let me ask you a question now. Was there a great disappointment in the time of Christ? Were, no. Were the Millerites, let me ask you again, were the Millerites in, in uh, let me say, not say good company, were they the only ones to experience a great disappointment? Was there a great disappointment in the time of Christ? Yes, Sandra. Yes. And yes. He, okay, so Carl, I heard you answer first. Go ahead. Yeah, well, the, um, because um, the Messiah they was expecting didn't come with like worldly power or pomp and ceremony. Um, that's what they were expecting at that time. Who's the day? For. Who's the day? Well, I'd, I'd say, I'd say the, um, the, the high priest, to be honest, the, the Sanhedrin and the, the spiritual leaders. Okay. The disappointment was that their Messiah was dead. Ah, uh, okay. So, so Carl, correct. The, 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 there was a group, a large group, who were expecting Christ to free them from the Romans, to set up his kingdom, and that the Jewish nation were going to be head. But then when Christ died... As Mike says, they experienced a bitter disappointment. Why? <laughs> because their Messiah, who they thought was going to bring them emancipation from the Romans, was dead. And when he, when he, he, he did, uh, when he was resurrected, he stayed with them for a little bit and went back. So they experienced a, a, a large group of those that were looking for the Messiah to come. So you remember Mark, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, and John, the, the, the week before Christ dies, um, the Sunday, he's traveling into Jerusalem and there is a great throng that flock him, isn't there? And the Bible yeah. says that all people around started to, started to proclaim Hosanna to glory to God in the highest. Why? Because they thought that this was it. He was coming mm -hmm. to reign as king and rule as king. And then later that week, he's cut off. They experienced a bitter disappointment. And the larger body, what happens to them? What happens to the larger body? They just dissipate. How many people are left after the great disappointment in the scriptures? 11. Pardon? 11. 11. There's, well, there's a little bit more than 11. Acts chapter 1. 120. 120. Well, yeah. 120, 120. So, so uh, the larger group dissipate and there was a smaller group left. And what does God do for that smaller group? Holy Spirit. He gives them the Holy Spirit. He, he bestows upon them the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And then what do they do? Go out and tell the world. Well, they, they go out. They spread throughout the world now. Yeah, they go out and they recorrect the misunderstanding that had occurred they, re they, 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 they correct the misunderstanding and they go and preach the present truth of a risen saviour correct or incorrect mm -hmm. yes okay okay. okay 
So let's move on. So there were five, five main groups that after October 22, 1844 uh, were left. You had those who aban abandoned any kind of religious belief. Now remember, um, people joined the message because it was popular. It, it was like a wave of emotion and people just joined it. A little bit like when Jesus was moving, coming into Jerusalem, people just heard the message and jumped on it. And it was some of those same people were the ones on the Friday saying, crucify him, crucify him. So one group, were, uh, one group that, that broke off from Miller Wright Adventism were those that abandoned any kind of religious belief. Then you had those who returned to their previous churches. Okay, group number three, a small group maintained that Jesus had come, but it had been a spiritual coming and they were known as the spiritualizers. Are we clear so far? And then group number four, main, they maintained the imminent return of Christ. They maintained the earth was the sanctuary to be cleansed and they were distinguished for what, what, what particular issue? It's right there, yeah. time setting. And then you had the smallest group num numbering no more than 50 to 100 people in number. They maintained that 1844 was a prophetic date, but they had gotten the event wrong. Seventh-day Adventists have their ancestry in this group. So when you hear the charge that Seventh-day Adventists have always been time setters, that's not correct. Historically, that's not correct. While, while they were part of the bigger group of Millerites, they weren't the group that came out that later became time setters. Does that make sense? Because you're going, you're going to hear that charge levied at you when you start to preach and teach the truths of the scriptures. Does that make sense, everyone? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Yes, it does. Let's keep going. So you had Millerite Adventism. You had... <clears throat> So the two main groups that you had after that, so you had those that abandoned any kind of religious belief, those that went back to their churches, those that were um, a spiritualizer, said that Christ had come, but been spiritual coming. Um, the other two groups you had were the mainline Adventists and the bridegroom Adventists, okay? So under the mainline Adventists, you have that man, Joshua Vaughan Himes and William Miller. And under the bridegroom Adventists, you have... Ellen G. White, Joseph Bates, and others, and others, but obviously the box was not big enough for, for me to put everyone in. 75% of, uh, of the groups that were left, or of the, the number that was left, 75% became mainline Adventists. In fact, if you've ever read Ellen White's writings and you, and you hear or you read the phrase nominal Adventism, anybody ever read that phrase? Nominal Adventism or nominal Adventists? Maybe not. This, the group on the left is what she's referring to. Those were the group that, that um, maintained um, that they, wanted, they, they were looking for Christ to come, but they, they, they didn't go on to accept the, the sanctuary, uh, the Sabbath, and, and some other doctrines that came out a, a little bit later on. And then you had 25% of the, of the number left um, bridegroom Adventists. In fact, let me ask you a question. Why do you think, you may not know, you may know, why do you think they were called bridegroom Adventists? Thinking, let me, let me give you some context to help. Um, um, why do you think they were called bridegroom Adventists? Thinking about Matthew chapter 25. 25. Yeah. Is that related to like um, the church, the church being the bride? Oh, okay, yeah, um, we're moving in the right direction. What the five else? wise virgins. The five wise. So in Matthew chapter 25, you have the, 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 the parable or the, yeah, the parable of the, of the uh, 10 virgins. Ten virgins. Yeah, the 10 virgins. Um, in uh, fact, when you get a chance, go back, read Matthew chapter, or study Matthew chapter 25, I think 1 through verse 13. And we'll, 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 we'll look at this um, in a few other slides um, later on. But they were called bridegroom. Adventist. <clears throat> Bit of a crude picture, but who's this man? Begins, name begins with H. Begins with H. Joshua Hines. 
No, not just Hiram, Hiram Edson. Hiram Medson. Hiram Medson. Hiram Edson. So where, yes. what does Hiram Edson, why does he come in to the, our study at this point? After October 22, 1844, why do you think we've got him as part of our study? Why is he, why is he important to our study right now? Andre, is it because after the disappointment, they got together um, and prayed <laughs> because, because obviously Christ didn't come in in the year they thought they got back together and prayed and studied again the scriptures to try and see what 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 really did happen at that time in earth's history yeah so it wasn't it wasn't years it was the very next day it was the very next day so october 22 1844 they all gathered on ascension rock waited 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 christ didn't come and there they in fact i'll let him i'll let you i'll let higher medicine tell you how they felt but the very next day, in fact, let me, let me do it now. Hiram Edson, Christ in his sanctuary, 162, paragraph one. Our expectations were raised high. And thus we looked for our coming Lord until the clock told 12 at midnight. The day had then passed and our disappointment had become a certainty. Our, our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted. And such a spirit of weeping came over us as never experienced before. It would seem like the loss of all earthly friends could have, no have been no comparison. We wept and wept till the day dawn. I don't know if you can begin to feel what they felt, what they experienced. They had placed everything on the line to preach this message. They had sold businesses, possibly houses. They'd sold everything that they had to finance the going forward of the message. And they believed the message. It was, it was evident in their actions. Uh, it was evident in Noah's actions that he believed the message. But October 22 came and went and Jesus didn't come. The very next day, I think, I'm not sure if it's in slides um, from now, but I'll tell you now, just in case it isn't. The very next day, Hiram Edson and O.R.L. Crozier, who was a teacher, they're sitting and they're studying um, and they're, 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 they're just talking about their disappointment and they decide to walk across his cornfield um, to go and comfort the other believers, is what his, his, um, his testimony says. And as they're walking, he stops and is looking heavenward. And his testimony is that he saw Christ move from the, from where to where? In fact, let me ask you. Holy to the most holy. The holy, the, host, the holy place to the most holy place. Okay. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. <clears throat> so mainline Adventists, abandoned the belief that October 22, 1850 was a prophetic date and they looked for new dates. So remember, mainline Adventists were known mm. for being time setters. Okay? It's important that you remember that because when, you're, when, you're, when, the, when, the, when the mud is flung at you as a Seventh-day Adventist and say, you guys have always been time setters, you need to know this history. In fact, let me say this as well. Seventh Day Adventism didn't come out of the great out of the great disappointment. They came through it. Okay, let me say that again. Seventh Day Adventism didn't come out of the great disappointment. They came Sorry. through it. Because the roots of Seventh Day Adventism, as we saw from last week, have always been there. Okay, but what God is doing is He's whittling down or getting His denominated people ready, <coughs> brought onto the scene so that they can do what he needs them to do <clears throat> just before the end comes. So, Mainline Adventists mm -hmm. abandoned the belief that October 22, mm -hmm. 1844 was a prophetic date, and they looked for new dates. So the Mainline Adventists, and it, it happens today, <laughs> the Mainline Adventists looked at the Bridegroom Adventists and called them fanatics. Called them fanatics for holding on to that date and saying, look, something happened. We just don't know what it is yet. And the bridegroom Adventist looked at the mainline Adventist and said, you guys have got it wrong. And it's the same thing 
in our church today. Those that are on the left, look at those that are on the right and say, you, you guys are in apostasy, and some are. <laughs> and those on the right, look at those on the left and say, you guys are in apostasy, and some are. And then you have those that are in the middle who are trying to walk what Christ has told them to walk. And both sides look at the middle and say, you guys are in apostasy. And this is why, one of the reasons why the shaking is going to happen, is happening, let me say in the present day, is happening. Because everyone is being shaken in their respective positions. But only those who are rooted and grounded on the scriptures are going to remain faithful, are going to remain firm, are going to remain with fruit on the limbs, are going to remain with leaves that don't wither. So again, mainline Adventists abandoned the belief that October 22, 1844 was a prophetic date and looked for new dates. So then you have, under mainline Adventists, you have Adventist Christian Church, which numbered about 25,000, um, and then that split, and then you have the Jehovah Witnesses. Did you know that we have the same lineage, Jehovah Witnesses? As, yes. And the Mormons. Because mm -hmm. all of those groups came about out of Millerite Adventism. Mm -hmm. Which kind of brings me to another study that we'll do at some point. <laughs> and that, that, that study is the study of the remnant church. How do you identify from scripture that you are actually in the right place? Because what, what Satan did is like, said, I can't stop the remnant church from coming on the scene. But what I can do is I can flood the world with churches and then people will be so confused that they'll either give up or they'll choose randomly without trying to find from the scripture which, which is the remnant. But that's for another study. So you have Jehovah's Witnesses coming out of Millerite Adventism, Mormonism coming out of um, uh, Millerite Adventism, Seventh-day Adventism coming through Millerite Adventism. <clears throat> and then you have the Bridegroom Adventists. Ellen White, Joseph Bates, uh, 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 and, and others, and others. They maintained that October 22, 1844 was a prophetic date. They maintained that October 22, 1844 was a prophetic date. <clears throat> William Miller, not William Miller, um, James White, Matthew 25 brings to view the parable of the 10 virgins. James White closely linked the parable with the second coming of Christ to, his, to this earth. In 1853, he wrote the following. Oops, why is it not moving? When we take the view of this parable that has been taken by the Advent body, a harmony will be seen. The 10 virgins represent those who participated more or less in the Advent movement. The going forth with lamps represents the movement of 1843, occasioned by the study and the proclamation of the word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Psalm 119, 105. The tarrying time <coughs> with the slumbering time. The midnight cry in the parable represents the powerful and glorious movement and work of God on the hearts of his people in, a, in the autumn of 1844. What is he saying? He's saying that what they experienced in the Millerite movement, the frenzy, and what happened afterward is, is pictured or is foretold in Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. Let me, see, let me just check. I think it's verse 1 through to verse 13. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through to verse 13. He's saying that they, as they continue to study the scriptures, they, begin to, they began to see new rays of light shining on scriptures that they hadn't uh, noticed in that way before. So that's how they got the, the name uh, bridegroom Adventists. So Hiram Edson and O.R.L. Crozier, um, Hiram Edson declares the vision, tells him, look, this is what I saw. O.R.L. Crozier, who was a teacher, begins to write it. And he writes it in pamphlets and he gets ready to publish it. Because now this, the, the, the group that is going to become the Seventh-day Adventists, now they have a biblical answer to what happened October 22, 1844. 
Hiram Medicine speaking. After breakfast, I said to one of my brethren, let us go and see and encourage some of our brethren. We started and while passing through a large field, I was stopped about midway of the field. Heaven seemed open to my view and I saw distinctly and clearly that instead of our high priest coming out of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to this earth on the 10th day of the seventh month at the end of the 2300 days, he, for the first time, entered on that day into the mm -hmm. second apartment. Now, here's, here's why I've, uh, I've italicized these and put them in yellow. You're going to have to study um, Hebrews chapter 9. And the reason you're going to have to study Hebrews chapter 9 and understand what Hebrews chapter 9 is, is because some of our own people are beginning to say that when Christ ascended after his resurrection, he went straight into the most holy place. Now, if, mm. if that is true, then Seventh-day Adventism is a lie. But Hebrews doesn't teach, in fact, Hebrews 9 doesn't teach that in the, in, in, the, in the King James Version. But if you've got a modern version, you may have a problem when you get to Hebrews chapter 9. So, Hiram Medson, let me read that again. And we're going to cover this. We're going to cover this in the, the 70 weeks um, and possibly in the 2300 days prophecy, those, those, those Bible studies. Hiram Medicine says, he, for the first time, entered on that day into the second apartment of the sanctuary. And that second apartment is called, which, what, what's the name of it? Holy of Holy. Holy place. The Holy of Holies, the most holy place. He had a work to perform in the most holy place before coming to the earth. Is that consistent with the, with the biblical um, truth of the sanctuary? Is that consistent? That the high priest has a different function to the normal priest yes no yeah. no it, it is yeah. not yeah that's biblical the, yes. remember, remember the priest the priest officiated day by day but he never was allowed to go into the most holy place only the high priest was allowed to go into the most holy place and how often did he go once a year once a year okay so what Hiram Edson is saying here is completely consistent with scripture and this is why, brethren, the sanctuary doctrine must be forefront in our mind. Because it's where our roots are, are firmly rooted. Everything else, if you imagine, if you imagine um, the sanctuary as a tree, all other branches, all other branches of doctrine that we have of Seventh-day Adventism, find their, 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 their source in the sanctuary. So again, he had a work to perform in the most holy place before coming to earth. So now they're beginning to see that they'd missed a step. They thought he was coming to cleanse the earth, but they missed a step that the high priest has to go into the most holy place before he comes to earth. He came to the marriage, or in other words, to the ancient of days to receive a kingdom, dominion and glory, and that we must wait for his return from the wedding. What chapter of scripture is he referring to in, ver in point nine and point ten? No, in point nine. What passage of scripture that, that, that he, in fact, yeah. Daniel, Daniel 7. Daniel 7, absolutely, Joseph. And what verses? Um, I think it's verse, is it verse 12 and 13? 12, 13, 14, absolutely. When Hiram Edson says that he, 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 he went to the ancient of days to receive a king. In fact, let's read it. Let's read it. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. What took place October 22, 1844 is referred to in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all nation, people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. And when you read later on in Daniel, you see that this kingdom is then given to the saints. Um, and that's verse 27. So, so Hiram Edson began to understand that, hold on a second, what, was, what took place October 22, 1844, was Christ, our high priest, going into the most holy place 
to go before the ancients of days to receive a kingdom, dominion and glory. And then he says he went to the marriage and we must wait until the return that he returns from the marriage, from the wedding, which is Matthew chapter 25. Does that make sense? Mm. Okay, so you're beginning to understand. Now, remember, at this point, they're not even Seventh-day Adventism, uh, Seventh-day Adventists. And at this point, there is no prophetic vision to confirm what they're studying. And that's an important point. And we're going we're gonna to come back to that point uh, before we finish. There is no Seventh-day Adventist at this point, And there is no prophetic vision to confirm that what he's studying is actually correct. All they're going off is the scriptures. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so they began, O.R.L. Crozier, the teacher, began to write um, pamphlets and articles beginning to disseminate and push out this new, this new understanding of what took place October 22, 1844. And we have the if, you have the, if you have the Ellen White app, you can read these pamphlets. You can read them. These pamphlets, these, these, these um, articles, you can read them and you can read firsthand what they, um, um, what they were going through, what they were studying. And you can read, read it in real time, as it were. There followed a careful investigation of what? The scriptures. The scriptures that touched this subject. So now they're studying not just the, 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 the Day of Atonement, not just the high priest going into the most holy place, but every scripture that touched on this point, they began to study. There followed a careful investigation of the scriptures that touched on this subject, particularly those in Hebrews. Now, remember, I've just finished the book of Hebrews again, and it's almost like I read a completely different book. I've, I've studied it many times, but in the time in which we live with the challenges that are coming upon Seventh-day Adventism from mm -hmm. inside, I implore you, go back to, to Hebrews and restudy those books, because Hebrews is... is, is is uh, a wonderful thesis. I, I'm, I'm lost for the phrase that I want. It's a wonderful thesis and a, 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 a solidifier of, of sanctuary doctrine and Seventh-day Adventist truth in those four, 13, 14 chapters. And this is where the principal challenge is going to come. I, I told you last week, when anyone leaves um, the, 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 the understanding of Seventh-day Adventism, the first thing that they attack is the sanctuary. And that's, that's not by chance. It's a satanic attack. Why? Because Satan knows if you cut down or you push over the load-bearing wall, what happens to the house? Oh, it's down. Yeah. If you've, if you've ever watched uh, like these restoration programs and they go and they knock the wall, if the wall is, 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 is a structural wall, they don't touch it. It's only those walls that are not structural that they, they take down. So Satan knows that if I can get the, the sanctuary out of the way, it's not going to be long before the Sabbath goes, before dress reform goes, before diet reform goes, before uh, the remnant church doctrine goes, before the prophet goes. It doesn't matter. So he, he spends his time on, 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 on trying to get rid of that central pillar. So we'll continue. There followed a careful, an, a careful investigation of scriptures that touched on this subject particularly those in Hebrews, but hi by Hiram Edson and two close associates, F.B. Hahn, who was a physician, and O.R.L. Crozier, a, a teacher. The result of this joint study was written up by Crozier and published first in the day dawn, a paper of limited circulation, and then in rewritten and enlarged form in a special issue of the Day Star on February 7, 1846. So you can read, you can read it. If you've got the Ellen White app or you, you, you manage to have the hard copies, you can read um, what they were studying and how they were studying and how they were coming to these truths as they were coming to them. And remember, at this point, there is no prophetic vision. And they're not yet Seventh-day Adventism, but God is bringing out, he's bringing out these, this group of denominated people, his church, who are going to be here at the last He's bringing them out and giving them back some, some, some core, fundamental, peculiar truths. Not strange, but peculiar because the rest of Christendom isn't preaching it or wasn't preaching it and are not preaching it to give to the world. Christ in his sanctuary. 
the rather lengthy presentation well supported by scripture. Now, this is another thing that you need to understand. The doctrines that we hold as the Seventh-day Adventist church are fully supported by scripture without vision. I say that again. The, 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 the doctrines that Seventh-day Adventists hold is fully supported by scripture without prophetic vision. Now, there, there are going to be some within the movement who will challenge that. They will challenge your understanding of the day for a year principle. They will challenge your understanding of uh, the, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. They will challenge your understanding of, of the Godhead. They will challenge your understanding of the sanctuary to be cleansed. They will challenge quite a, a whole load of things. So you need to understand, and I need to understand, that the, 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 the doctrines that we hold are well supported by scripture. So let me read that again. The rather lengthy presentation, well supported by scripture, brought hope and courage to their hearts as it clearly showed that the sanctuary to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days is in heaven and not on earth as they had believed earlier. So when they were misunderstood, when they misunderstood, what did they do? They went back to the scriptures and they continued studying. They could, they continued looking at the verses and they connected verses as they came up to them with what they were trying to study. And a beautiful new picture began to form. So 1846, you've got another group, Albany Adventists and Bridegroom Adventists. The Albany Adventists, <clears throat> 30,000. They were also called First Day Adventists. So your nominal Adventists, your, 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 uh, your Albany Adventists, these are the first day Adventists. <clears throat> and your, your bridegroom Adventists, 50 to 50 and 100. Small, small group. Less than 1% of the, of the larger group. But through them, God was going to bring and continue bringing his truth back. Now watch this. This is, this is when, I, when, I, when I saw it in the scriptures, I was like, this is amazing. So... Whenever God has tried to preserve his truth and he's called out a people, it's always less than 1% of the bigger group. Let me say that again. Whenever yeah. God has brought people out to preserve his truth and to preserve his name, when you look at the numbers, it's always less than 1% that, that go through. So let me, let me, let me give you some examples. When the world was destroyed by flood, how many people survived? Eight. Eight. When, when Gideon had an army to fight against um, the, the, the destruction, destruction of his people, how many people started in the army? 30,000, I think. 32,000. 32, After the first shaking, how many people left? I can't remember that. 10,000. No, no, no. 10,000 were left. So 22,000 yeah. leave after the first shaking. When the second sifting happens, how many people are left? Um, some 300. 300. 300. 300. Less than 1%. In Millerite Adventism, when God is bringing out a people to give this message to the world, it starts off with, with 50,000 people. It gets whittled down through various means to 50. As a percentage, 1%, less than 1%, I think. Yeah. So what you're seeing is while the larger group may profess one thing, it's only those who are going to be true to God and who are going to stand on his word that actually make it through. Now, I, I don't know. <laughs> how many people are going to be saved uh, off this planet? But right about now, there are 22 million Seventh-day yeah. Adventists, uh, many more people who don't claim Seventh-day Adventists, many more people waiting for Christ to come. But we are told, Hebrews chapter 12, 25 through 27, Amos chapter 9 and verse 9 onwards, that a, a shaking and a sifting is taking place and will continue to take place. And it's getting more and more violent and it's taking out more and more people. The ranks will not be diminished because those who leave will be made up from those who come in. 
But we know that the remnant is a small group. Jesus says in Matthew 24 and 9 and 10 that they are going to be hated of all the world. Now, right now, how many people in the world? Seven billion? Eight billion. Yeah, seven, seven billion? So eight, eight billion. Eight, 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 eight billion. Okay, eight billion. Let's say eight billion. Even if, there are, even if there are just 22 million out of 8 billion, are still a very, very small number. So the reason why we're studying these scriptures, uh, studying these, um, these, these Bible studies, because we want to make sure, we want to make sure that we're under the, the saving wing of Christ. We want to make sure that we are rooted and that we are grounded in Christ and in his truth. I remember saying last week that... Um, we're at the last, it's the final church. So God isn't calling out another group from Seventh-day Adventism. What Amos chapter 9, 9 through 11 tells us is that he's shaking out all those who are false. But, that, but Satan has a hole for every single one of us to go out of. So it may not be through apostasy, but it may be through covetousness. It may not be for covetousness, but it may, through, it may be through um, uh, jealousy. Satan has a hole for every single one of us to fall through. And what we need to do is make sure that we are, strong, uh, we, are, we are rooted and that we are grounded in Christ. So where to the little flock? <clears throat> the Lord showed me in vision more than one year ago that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary. So this is 1840. So she's writing this 1847, which means she, she got the vision 1846. But that means they were preaching the sanctuary message two years prior to her getting the first vision that uh, the, 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 the sanctuary doctrine was correct. So for two whole years, God allowed his people to study the words of scripture and preach the message before he gave them a vision to confirm that what they were preaching was correct. So the Lord showed me a vision more than one year ago that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary, etc. And that it was his will that Brother Crozier should write out the view which he, had, which he gave as in the Daystar Extra, February 7th, 1846. I feel fully authorized by the law to recommend that extra to every saint. And like I said, notice the date. She writes it in 1847, which means she got the vision over a year, more than a year ago. So 1846, let's say. But... Uh, Crozier and Edson began writing and studying this thing from 1844. So we, another evidence that we can, we can believe that the, the, the sanctuary doctrine that we have came about via Bible study, not via vision. It was only confirmed through vision. So the day year principle, the day year principle of prophetic interpretation applies to 70 weeks and 2300 days of Daniel 8 and 9. We're going to skip past this because we, ha we have a whole Bible study on those two, those two chapters. Um, Daniel 8, 14 speaks of the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. The 70 weeks and the 2300 days began in 457 BC and the entire period ended in 1844. We're going to study this in detail because again, brothers and sisters, our own people are beginning to challenge uh, and say 457 is the wrong date. It should be before that. They're saying that Artaxerxes wasn't the decree that we should take. We should take the decree of Cyrus. And what we're going to do, we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt and we're going to use the date, if at all we can, because when you study this, the, 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 these, these decrees, some dates aren't even given. The most specific date that is given is that of Artaxerxes. But we're going to give the people the doubt and we're going to do the timeline from the date that they give. And if it, if it doesn't fit, we, we reject it. That's how, the, that's how these, these nugget of Seventh-day Adventism, that's how they began. They, they didn't despise prophesying, but they took what was said, they married it to the scriptures, or not married it, they tested it against the scriptures. And if it, if it didn't fit, they rejected it. If it fit, they put it on the shelf. So... What begins to happen as they study and as they pray and as they continue to study the scriptures, <clears throat> what truths did God begin to bring out? 1854, the sanctuary connected with the Sabbath, Uriah Smith. 1863, Seventh-day Adventism becomes officially a, a movement, a church. 1863, June the 6th, Ellen White gets her vision on our health reform. Gets her vision on health reform <clears throat> and begins to begins to talk about the body being a temple 
and how to preserve that body. 1874, the sanctuary and the second coming. 1863, the sanctuary and the Ten Commandments. 1869, the sanctuary and the state of the dead. As I said, you'll see that all of our doctrines are connected to the sanctuary. All of them you can preach from the sanctuary and all of them stand uh, uh, by themselves. So again, 1863, Seventh-day Adventism becomes officially um, the movement that is going to bring this uh, reformation, Protestant reformation to its end. And now they have been given the tenets of their faith and the, the cherries to put on top of the, 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 the cake that's, that was started by Martin Luther uh, and by Melanchthon and by Zwingli and by all those different reformers. So where did the name come from? Does anyone know? Where did, the, where, did, where did the, the name Seventh day Adventism come from? David Hewitt. From who? David Hewitt. D David, David Hewitt. Okay, I think this is another Hewitt speaking. Do you want to, do you want to give a little bit of background? Oh, um, as it's been said that we used to go by uh, many other names um, as, as Adventists. So our our church was called Adventists, but then to differentiate the name, they go between different, different names until the whole uh, a meeting when this white was in labor and David Hewitt came up with the name Seventh-day Adventists. Okay. Biography Volume 1. Having voted to adopt a name, the discussion now turned on what the name should be. The name Church of God was proposed and zealously advocated by some. It was objected, so it was objected that that name was already in use by some denominations, and on this account was indefinite. Besides having to the to the world an appearance of presumption, Brother White. Brother White remarked that the name should be name taken should be one which let me read that again. I'm not sure. Brother White remarked that the name taken should be one which would be the least objectionable to the world. There's a slide missing. I'm not sure yeah. where. That, oh, there's a slide missing. I'm, basically, as 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 uh, Foxy has said, they they continue to come with names, and they said <clears throat> they came up to the name Seventh Day Adventism, Seventh Day Adventist. And then God confirmed that name through vision. And he said that name is to be a standing rebuke to the world because it bears the, 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 um, it, be it bears the credentials of that movement in the name. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, after, when this meeting is finished, probably this week, I will include the slides that are missing. I'm not quite sure where they are. Um, I will include the slides that are missing. And when I send it out, you will have, um, the full expose of what happened. So God confirmed that name Seventh-day Adventism, Adventist, because it was a standing rebuke to the Protestant world and that it bore the, the credentials of their, their, their name and their, what they stood for in that name. So that's why I asked you at the beginning, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Because wrapped up in that name is just more than the Sabbath and just more that you're, than you're looking for the second coming of Christ. Now, <clears throat> Important fact, last two slides and then we'll, we'll have a discussion for a few moments, ask some questions. During this whole time, I could not understand the reasoning of my brethren. She's talking about when they're bringing together these doctrines from the scriptures. During this whole time, I could not understand the reasoning of my, my brethren. My mind was locked as it were, and I could not comprehend the meaning of the scriptures we were discussing. Now, this isn't unique to Ellen White. She's saying that when they were studying the scriptures, she had to study like everyone else. It was not until they came to the truth from the scripture that God would give her a vision and confirm that's the truth. That situation is, is not unique to Ellen White. Daniel was the same way. He had to be, he, there were times where he had vision. He didn't understand it. He writes, he writes the fact. I, I, I saw the vision, um, but none understood it. I saw the vision, uh, but I was six certain days. Then I rose and did the king's business. It's not until the angel comes and gives him an understanding of what he'd seen that he, he fully understood what was uh, being communicated. Final slide. 
I was in this condition of mind until all the principal points of our faith were made clear to our minds in harmony with the word of God. Let me read that sentence again. It's powerful. I was in this condition of mind until all the principal points of our faith were made clear to our minds in harmony with the word of God. What is she saying in that first sentence? What is she saying? <clears throat> God wanted them to understand what he was saying to them from the scriptures and scriptures alone. Mm -hmm. So their mind had to grasp it. Absolutely. And then the, the, the uh, vision kind of just affirmed it, but their actual minds and understanding had to grasp it from the scripture alone. Absolutely. Well, and that's also, Andre, also, oh, also, also God does... Did you finish that, America? Yes, I finished. Thanks. Um, All right. Just, yeah, but, um, God never leaves his people in confusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, unlike Babylon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Babylon is confusion and so on. God makes it clear. Mm -hmm. Like I was reading the other day in Psalms 107. Mm -hmm. And um, where God, where David says, uh, all that men would praise God, would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his mercy unto, unto the children of men. Mm -hmm. And then it, that's in verse 8, then verse 15, then verse 21. You see, God repeats things, so he makes it makes it clear. So that's just in, you know, in connection with what you're saying. God right. gives it clear. Absolutely. So it's an important <laughs> point that we need to make sure that we grasp and never forget all the principal truths of Seventh-day Adventism can be found in the scriptures. You don't need, while God gave us a prophet, you don't need the prophet's visions to confirm your faith in the doctrines. I hope that makes sense. I'm not saying that we don't need the prophet. I'm not saying that we, don't, we, 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 we dispense with her writings. But what I am saying is the sanctuary, the second coming, the state of the dead, uh, righteousness by faith, uh, the sanctuary cleansed, um, uh, what are the other ones? All of those pillars that we have are rooted firmly and squarely and, and completely <clears throat> in the scriptures, in the scriptures between Genesis and Revelation. The problem is we've just not been studious enough, studious enough to, to study them out. We've taken for granted what we believe. We've believed because we've grown up to believe. We've believed because we've heard it so long. But we read last week that until thus tested, some are not going to realize how confused their idea of truth is. So that's why we're, put, that's why we're, we're going through these, these um, pillars of Seventh-day Adventism. Now, all of, the, all of the presenters I've asked to present on the pillars, I've asked to present minus Ellen White, minus the words of Ellen White. And there's a reason for that because as she said, the Millerites, they came to their truth or they came to the truth minus her visions. They came to it directly from the scriptures. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a look, we're going to examine, we're going to critically examine the, 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 the doctrines that we hold um, and we're going to study them from the scriptures right let me stop sharing okay are there any points any questions uh, any, anything we've got about 13 minutes left yes I have one what question is, uh, who's this Hewitt what is the best book other than the great controversy mm -hmm. for reading these things. For, for reading for reading what the history yes uh so you have um the test the testament is volume one is is is, is mm -hmm. very good um testament is volume one there are there's a book called the pioneers the sanctuary in 1844 i don't have the name the, the name of the author to to um Mm. In fact, Clive, do me a favor. As I mentioned the books, put them in the chat because this is recording. And what I'll do is I'll go back and then I will um, get the authors and send out the, the, um, 
the office. Amen. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Elda. So, yes. so testimonies volume sure. one. Mm. Yes. Yes, we just Testim testimonies reading. volume one. Um, the Pioneers, the Sanctuary, 1844. Um, uh, um, the Cross and its Shadow, S. N. Haskell. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Sanctuary and its the, the Sanctuary and its Services, Emil Andreessen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Messenger of the Lord, Herbert Douglas. Um, oh, there's so many. <laughs> there's so many. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I, I, I'll compile it. I'll compile a list. Oh. I'll get it sent yes. out. The Great Controversy. No. The Great Controversy. Yeah, yeah. She said outside of the Great Controversy. Great Controversy is a great one because um, it's history and prophecy together. Mm. Uh, so the first part, the first half of, in fact, everything up to chapter 35 um, is, is saturated with scriptures as well, um, is the, the history of the Reformation, um, chapter 18 is called um, An American Reformer, talking about William Miller. Um, but chapter 35 onwards is what we're living right now. And is there any hope of getting uh, those copies? Is there any hope of getting those copies? Well, yeah. um, so let me see. The Great Controversy is always available. Uh, you can, you can... No, 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 those not that. Which ones? Your left today. I'm part um, of it. Oh, oh. oh, yes. Um, so the video, one second, one second, Naomi. One second, Naomi. One second. Um, so the, the, the videos are on YouTube, uh, if you have YouTube. Um, the, the slides, uh, I can make them available, definitely. I just need to convert them into PDF and I can, I can, I can get them to you. Um, yeah, that's not a problem. How, how do you get the videos? They're on YouTube. Thank you. Yes. I will send you the YouTube link, Brother Maxwell. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I will send you the YouTube link. Um, Foxy, did you? Oh, no. Yeah. Foxy, did you have a question? Uh, Andre, I've got a question. Okay. Um, one second, Trevor. One second. There's, Tre there's, there's Fox, and then there is Naomi, and then there is you, Trevor. Yeah. I am Hedson. Mm hmm. Uh, was he a direct uh, eyewitness to the movement of Jesus or it was a vision? He says his own testimony is that when he's walking through the cornfield, he sees, he looks up and sees a vision with his eyes that Christ moved from the holy place to the most holy place. Those are his words. Um, I don't know how else to take that. He says that's what he saw and he began to, he began to, he began to study from that point. So whether it was a vision, whether he saw it with his own eyes, he says, I walked through the field, I looked up, I saw Christ move from the, I saw a vision, I saw Christ move from the holy place to the most holy place. And then he begins to write from that point. Okay. Well, it would have to be a vision because he saw it the next day, didn't he? Yeah, he saw it the, he, yeah, he saw it the next day. I, the way I understood Fox's question was, did he see it with his own eyes? Is that what you're asking, Fox? Yes, or it was a vision because the idea was that um, uh, you were talking about um, what they study. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to have that clear whether or not he, he because whether he saw with a high witness or he had a vision of heaven open and what happened. So it, certainly it, it was a it was a vision, not a study. So they only they only studied the vision. They studied the vision. Yeah, so, so, go on, sorry, continue. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, so, so he, has the, he has the vision of what took place the day before, and they study from that point. They study that, they, they, they realize, hold on a second, something different happened to what we thought was going to happen, and then they begin mm -hmm. to study from that point, and he sees that with his eyes. Okay. Uh, Naomi and then Trevor. Um, when you explain that, the disciple, the time where they had with, they was with Jesus, and mm -hmm. when Jesus died, um, they feel lonely and not ask what happened to them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I know they, 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 they become a little bit confused, and that brother said, send, they sent the Holy Spirit, but before the Pentecostal day, I would like to, uh, I would like to know. What exactly 
they were thinking what what exactly what the confusion brought to them because they thought the master's gone. Yeah, I would like to just clarify, to clarify this that point. You're asking what did the disciples, what were they thinking? Yeah, because the, before they was with Jesus, even though we, they was with the master, they was, they, some of them, they couldn't even understand it properly. Mm -hmm. They wasn't standing firm to pray because when Jesus uh, was telling them, can you not stay, not spend an hour for pray? But when Jesus died, mm -hmm. when they saw Jesus gone, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like you stress you you explain a little bit that what uh, uh, happened to them. I know some of them they finish, uh, but before that the Pentecostal day before the Holy Spirit had come. I would like you clarify what happened to them in that period of time. What they was doing. Okay, so if I understand the question, so. They expected Christ to free them from the Romans, to sit himself on the throne and for them to be elevated. Um, Christ constantly told them, that's not what I've come for. I've come to die. Um, they, they, up until his death, they still didn't understand. Andre, you want to mute? Uh, yeah. So I'm not okay. sure why that happened. Um, I'm not sure how much you heard. <laughs> So they, they expected Christ to, to, to be, uh, sit as king, to reign, and that they were going to be his people. He'd constantly told oh, them, that's, okay. not what I've, that's, what, that's not what I've come for. I've come to die. They didn't understand that. And the reason they didn't understand that is because they were looking too far forward. And sometimes we're guilty, we're guilty of the same thing. We look too far forward and miss that Christ says, there's, there's certain things that you're going to have to go okay. through before the consummation of my second coming. So he dies, they're dejected, they're despondent, um, they, they may be a bit confused, um, they're scared because um, they realize that the people who were connected with Christ, maybe the same thing that happened to Christ is gonna happen to them. Christ resurrects, okay. tells them, listen, I'm gonna, shows them, <clears throat> he shows them uh, himself and then he goes away and says, look, you go, into Jerusalem and wait there until uh, you'll receive power. Acts chapter, we're, in, we're now in Acts. Um, they, they, they're there in, in the upper room. They put away their differences, but they're not, not, they're not only putting away their differences, they're studying. When you look at Peter's words in Acts chapter one, they're actually studying. They're studying the prophecies of, just, of, of what's just happened. Then Acts chapter two, um, the, the Bible says that the, when the day of Pentecost has fully come, they were all in one place of one accord. Holy Spirit comes, gives them power to go and now proclaim the present truth of his, of his resurrection. So I, I hope that answers your question. They had a disappointment. Yes, it, it, thank you. Okay. Yeah. And the, uh, uh, the Bible doesn't say... Yeah, oh, okay. um, Pard pardon? Uh, He's traveling. Oh. Just bear with uh, me, just, Sister Fata. Let me let Naomi finish. Uh, when you said Peter was because it, um, it was they was to the, what they learned with the master. So at the same time what they was with Jesus, they was uh, wrote the notes. Yes, they was uh, kept everything, and then there was at the same time they were they were read write the what the you know the accident or the things happen. You know what I mean? Uh, they I, were, uh -huh. was the, are, are you saying did they write because notes? Because you said were... when when go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, because you said Peter came, they went back, they went back and they stood it. They stood what happened, you know what Jesus teach them so because they were scared. So they came together, a group of uh, uh, people, mm -hmm. and then there was um uh, exercise like um, um, uh, putting things together uh, to understand what's going to happen. That was like that. Well, no. They, all what they did is they revisited the same scriptures that they had in the same words that Christ had spoken to them, but now they were seeing it in a different light. Okay. Not it after the event, so what they had misunderstood before the event became clearer once the event had happened. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you.
clarify. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Brother Simpson. Yeah, morning, RJ. Morning, Ron. You, you made mention of the name Seventh Adventist. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that it meant just more than Sabbath keeping and looking for the second coming of Christ. I was wondering if you were going to go into that because I've been pondering on this mm -hmm. and, and given the presentation that Dr. Lowe gave at Manchester South mm -hmm. uh, in 2014, I would believe that Seventh Adventism also hints at a bit of premillennialism uh, in so much that we're not only just looking for Christ to come, mm -hmm. but we're looking for the seventh day, the typological seventh day. Mm -hmm. So we've done 6,000 years of sin mm -hmm. and we're looking for the 1,000 year mm -hmm. of sin free existence. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody has to adhere to this, whether it be the righteous or the unrighteous. Mm -hmm. The righteous will do it in heaven and the unrighteous will do it on earth dead. And Satan himself will have nobody to tempt for that thousand years. Mm -hmm. So I, th I was thinking that you were going to allude to something like that, um, but then you, you, didn't, you didn't give us anything. You <laughs> said seven events meant more, and then you left us. I don't know, maybe you, uh, this is sort of, a, I don't know, they do that in television shows where you come back next week to get the, is that what you're doing, Brother Andre? <laughs> Not at all, Brother Trevor. Not at all. Um, I, did, I, I said that Seventh-day Adventism takes in more than just the seventh day. And, and oh, okay. yeah, takes in more. Um, but what you're talking about is a complete study in and of itself. Um, yeah, that, that's a complete study in and of itself. The, the seven years of um, 7,000 years or the seven, um, how, how do you put it? How did you phrase it? The seven? It's seven, typological. Seven, yeah, I think seven day of, yeah. I know what you're talking about. I just don't remember how you phrased it. No problem. And I think you can get this uh, slide from uh, the, the presentation from uh, Patrick, Patrick Lowe. Um, and so it basically it alludes, uh, alludes to the fact that um, two major premises is that the concept of a week mm -hmm. is purely of God's imagination. Mm -hmm. And not only the physics, the, the physical week, uh, which has no planetary motion, mm -hmm. the prophetic week, which is Christ's uh, redemption, and then the typological week, which is the entire package of 6,000 years of corrupt earth and then 1,000 years of pure earth. So uh, you're saying it's another study. I'm not going to preempt you, but I'm sure you'll go on to give us something like that sometime in the future. But then you still have to come back and tell us it takes in much more. I know you're not ready to give it us now, but uh, mm -hmm. tell us when you're ready and we'll be here listening as to why Seven Day Adventist takes in much more than just uh the sabbath just and the more than just the second Christ. coming of christ yeah absolutely and and part of the pillars with the pillars that we're going through we're going to begin to answer that question okay yeah. all right so i'll be here next week it's okay. still morning over here uh and then uh, uh so thanks ever so much no and, problem uh, good work blessings praise God, praise God. thank you anyone else we've got we've uh, we started at 10 past so i'll give you a few more minutes grace <laughs> anyone else the, the link which you have given me here yeah, is not working. Yeah? I have not sent a link yet. No, so somebody has sent me. I don't know. Okay, Max, I'll, Brother Max, I'll send it to you once the meeting's finished, okay? Okay, no, thank you. I'll, I'll send it to you. Okay, okay so any, anyone else? Anybody else? Question, point, um, anything that you've learned? Next week, what is, it, what is the teaching? And we have a new, we'll have a different... Um, teacher. Yes, yeah. next week we're going to begin looking at that central pillar. So what we've done, uh, the, the, these last few weeks we've gotten up to, we've gone from Genesis all the way through to, to um, Revelation and out the other end. And we've seen that God has followed an order. And now we see, and then we saw that God brought this, uh, his truth back through the Reformation. And then that, that final piece of the Reformation is, 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 um, expressed or, or, or taken forward through this group that that is called Seventh-day Adventism okay so now what we're going to do is have a look at the peculiar um, doctrines of Seventh-day Adventism beginning with uh, the central pillar which is where the the, 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 seven, the, the, the bridegroom Adventist started which was the sanctuary so next week we are going to uh, uh, deal with the sanctuary structure okay we're going to look at the following week. We're going to be doing the, the feasts that are connected with the sanctuary. 
And then we're going to do the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9. And then we're going to do uh, the, two, the 2300 days of Daniel chapter 8. And then we're going to do uh, why 1844 is a, is, is a date. Why do we hold that date? And is it, is it biblically sound? And then, so I'll tell you now, the 29th of May, the 29th of May, put that date down. This is what we're going to do for Bible study time. We are going to have a mock trial. We're going to have a mock trial. What is a mock trial? A mock trial is where, I see your hand raised, Max. Max. Um, a mock trial is where we're going to, it's almost like a midterm exam. We're going to have maybe a judge. We're going to have some solicitors and we're going to have a prosecution and everyone that joins that call will be, will, will be on, um, will be on trial for being a Seventh-day Adventist. But the only, the only thing that we're going to look at is the things that we've studied up until that point. So we won't, we won't try you on uh, the state of the dead. We won't try you on righteousness by faith. We will only try you on Adventism's history. Yes, we, we, we will we'll try you on um, the sanctuary. We'll try you on the 2300 days, the 70 weeks, the sanctuary structure, the feast. You'll be tried on those things, okay? So that's, that's May the 29th. The, the post is already done. Um, it'll come out later. But May the 29th, we're going to have a mock trial. I, I'm, I'm hoping that nobody decides not to come. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be, um, it's learning. That's all it is. It's learning. Jesus did the same thing. He sent out his disciples to do some work. They came back. They're like, Lord, this is amazing. Even the devil, devils are subject to us. And then he says, look, don't be happy at that. Be happy that your name's written in heaven. So, so, so that's what we're going to do. May the 29th. We're going to have a mock trial and it's going to be like a midterm. So um, we're not quite sure of the mechanics yet of how it's all going to work. But everyone that comes on the call will be on trial. Um, you don't have to speak if you don't want to. But um, yeah, we, we're going to try ourselves as some of the Adventists. We'll have a process, like it's a prosecution. So it is sanctuary, feasts, and what well, after feast what? I missed the next the, word. The sanctuary structure, the mm. feast connected with the sanctuary, the 70 weeks mm. of Daniel chapter 9, the uh, 2300 days of Daniel chapter 8, uh, and the, the 1844 as a prophetic date. Okay? So every week that you come, up until the May 25th, please take some notes. Please take extensive notes. Like I said, we've not, uh, I've not worked out the mechanics of the program yet, but um, that's the nugget. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a, a mock trial. Any other questions, points? We've got three minutes before I have to close off. Can I ask a question? Maybe this may need to yeah, be addressed ahead, another time. Mm -hmm. So um, according to um, William Miller, mm -hmm. Hiram Edson, Ellen G. White, mm -hmm. time scale wise, where are we now? What do you mean? In uh, So we're after them. Yeah, um, I meant like uh, according to their prophetic times before, uh, the second coming. Oh, in, um, in relation to the second coming. Yes. Yeah. Where, time where, skills. Where oh, are we oh, now? Oh, okay. So that is a. But study. This is, maybe we need to go back to this another time. Because but let me give let me give you some let me give you some text to study. So here's the thing. Yeah, that's here's, here's great. The thing. Let, let me say it like this. All of the Bible, in in, in the book Education, page one twenty five, paragraph two, Ellen White says the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which all of it in the whole book clusters is the redemption plan. She mm -hmm. says she she says that. Um, the, the 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 burden of every book and every passage is an unfolding of this wondrous theme. So let me let me break down what she means. Every single passage of the Bible has something to do with um, salvation. There are some passages in there are some books in the Bible that are more prophetic on the surface than others. So mm -hmm. if you want to know where we are in relation to the coming of Christ, you read uh, Matthew twenty four. Mm -hmm. Looking specifically at verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, verse 10, you, you look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through to verse 13. In fact, I, I, I can't even say that. The parables that Jesus gave 
I would hate, I would, mm-hmm. I, would, I would day. But let me give you. Some. I mean, hmm? I, I, I get that. I just want to see if it all correlates. Well, well that's what I'm. T- that's what I'm. That's what I'm showing you. Um, so ah, Matthew twenty five okay. one through thirteen, Matthew twenty four mm-hmm. seven through ten, uh, Revelation mm-hmm. chapter thirteen eleven through seventeen, um, Revelation seventeen, Revelation mm-hmm. eighteen, um, Luke twenty one. I don't know if you're catching all of this. Well, I, I, I'm trying. I, I, <laughs> yeah. What was the one before Luke? Uh, Revelation eighteen seventeen. Sorry. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's it's the thing is Samantha. It's all over the place, and in diff- and the way that God brings it is in different. So let me give it. Let me give you a, a, a quick um, a, cl- a quick um, example. So in Genesis, <laughs> in fact, yeah. Let me give it to you. In Genesis chapter forty-seven. Genesis chapter forty-seven. I think I've gone through this already. Genesis chapter forty-seven. We find a, a narrative that in the, in the kingdom of Egypt, there is a famine. Joseph yeah. knew that the famine was coming. When his family came to Egypt, he said to them, when they ask you, what is your trade? You tell them farmers because they hate farmers. What happens is they get sent to a different part of Egypt. Joseph knows a famine is coming. When the famine arrives in Genesis 47, all of Egypt is in disarray because there's a famine. They all mm. come to Joseph, but God's people are safe in the country. They're sep- While they're in Egypt, they're not affected by what's taking place in Egypt. But that's not even mm. the point that I want to make. The Bible says in Genesis 47, when money failed in the land of Egypt, the people said, um, we, we, we can't die of starvation. So they go to Joseph and say, look, let me sell you my cattle and our land on my cattle. So Joseph says, okay, if the money fails, some of your cattle, I'll give you bread to eat. Um, the famine is worse the next, the second year. The money is still at an all time, the economy is still at an all time low. And the people mm-hmm. say, look, they come back to Joseph the second year and they say to him, look, um, we've got nothing else to sell. So buy us and our land so that we may have bread. The people were willing to be made slaves just so they could eat because the money failed, the economy had crashed. You Mm. fast forward now to Revelation chapter 13 and you see the same example. In the book of Esther, there is Haman is angry with Mordecai because he doesn't bow down to him at the command of the king. Because of that, Haman wants to exterminate all of the Jews. And his wording is there are a certain group of people in all the king's realm who don't serve the king, they have their own laws and um, it, doesn't serve the pro- it doesn't serve the king to, pro- it doesn't profit the king to have them, so kill them. That's another example of, of, of and what you do then is you take, you take history, no, you take mm-hmm. history and you, 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 you superimpose prophecy on top of it and you begin mm-hmm. to see how close we are. Does that make mm. sense? Yeah. In, Daniel chapter, yeah. in Daniel chapter one, Daniel is facing a health crisis. The, 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 um, the head of state says to Daniel, you need to put into your body something that is, is it, he knows that he shouldn't put in. Daniel says, you know what? I'd rather be true to God than to put into my body what I shouldn't put in. He gains favor. He's able to be a witness. That decision doesn't... That, that stepping stone comes into its own six chapters later, five chapters later for Daniel and two chapters later for the three Hebrew men. The decision that they made in the health crisis facilitated the decision that they made when there was a religious crisis. Mm. Does that make sense? So, it, so, it, it so does, in, yeah. in, regards, mm-hmm. in regards to um, timelines, there's no one book that I could give you. See, most people think okay. that the Bible is just, the prophetic books are just Daniel, Revelation, but all of the books have prophetic elements. Yeah, they all go hand in hand. Absolutely, yes. mm-hmm. absolutely, because it's one hom- homogenous book. Yes, Does literally, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, as we go through these pillars and we do more studies, hopefully more and more things will, will, will come out. Okay, Brevin. Okay. I've got to- Well, cl- thank I've, you anyway. Uh, yeah. No problem. Mm-hmm. No problem, Samantha. Last thoughts or comments, because I've got to close this meeting. I've got one more speaking engagement at six o'clock, um, and I need to take a. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
All right, brothers and sisters, thank you very much. Ne like I said, next week, three o'clock, um, Brother Mike Bebe will, will take us through the, um, the sanctuary structure and then we'll continue to go through the pillars of Seventh day Adventism. I hope that you've been blessed. Uh, let me see. Elder Palmer, are you still here? Thank you, Andre. No yes, problem. Sir. Elder Palmer, can you pray for us, please? I just would like to say thank you so much because I'm learning. That is a school. We come all together to learn it. Thank you so much. God be thank praised. You. God, God be Bless praised. All of, us, all of us have gifts to be shared amongst ourselves so that we, yeah. there is no one gift that is bigger than the other. We've made it like that, but no one gift is bigger than the other. Every gift has its place for the edification of the whole body. That's Ephesians. Amen. 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 Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Out of yes. Andre, Andre, thank you very much for, for what you. Um, just a quick note to those who are listening: if there's if there's one thing you can do, is to be be an effective disciple. Bring bring someone to the meeting next week. Mm. Just find one. Just find one person. Mm. Just find one person to 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 invite. And sometimes we make discipleship and ministry complicated. Mm. Actually, all God might want for you is to pray over a name this week and invite them to come next week and we can keep spreading this word. Let's just bow our heads really quickly. Lord God of heaven, we thank you that you are a great and mighty and awesome God. We thank you that uh, we could search the world over and never find anyone like you. And Lord, as time winds up, as um, the situation draws close, help us to realize that you have placed us here for a purpose. You have brought the word to us to save us and that whatever your word has said, it will come to pass. And so Lord, as we continue to dip into your word, as we um, uh, spend time preparing and reminding us of um, how we have been formed and wonderfully made your purpose for us in our lives, May we see the spiritual growth in, our, in, our, in us individually and collectively. May we begin to bear the fruits of the spirit that you, that you so want us to, to bear. May we not look at others who are the pioneers or the great men of the Bible, uh, the great women of the Bible. May we not look at that as being something that happens to other people, but something that can happen to us too. And so, Lord, as we press forward, may your name be glorified. May you be lifted up, because we know if you are lifted, you will draw all men unto us. May we be effective disciples. May we be effective in our witnessing, and our, our lips will, will, will speak about you all the day long. And Lord, may we continue to realize that if we are with you, we will be evergreen. We will be able to stand uh, in these last days, as difficult as they may seem. You will save us, Lord. And so we thank you for Elder Crawford. We thank you for all the, the, the different presenters that will come over the weeks to come. And may we never tire in hearing the good news of salvation. Because we ask that, in fact, Lord, be with us into this new week as well as, as we step forward into whatever we don't know about, but you know. Bless us and keep us, because we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.